don't want to encourage you to make this insane step of um, climbing off the cliff and dangling uh, in the in the attempt to become a full-time paid author who lives off of it. But should you make that decision, I can I can tell you from my own experience and from um, some analyses of the way things seem to work when people approach challenge that can help you understand what to expect. And I'll also make some suggestions about how to strategize um, your platform. Has anybody heard about what a platform is this week? <laughs> yeah, well I have a, a slightly different take, I think, that might be um, useful, I hope. But first, oh yes, my name is Ransom, she said that, and then you have the, the handout here. This is instead of PowerPoint slides. This, these would have been my slides, um, those graphics. So let us begin. And to begin, I'm going to read you something. There is a, a bit of this quote that I'm going to read on your handout in the top left. And this is the complete extent to which I will encourage you to make this decision. Okay? And it goes like this. This is paraphrased from Sterling Hayden's book, Wanderer. To be truly challenging... A voyage, like a life, must rest on a firm foundation of financial unrest. <coughs> Voyaging belongs to the wanderers of the world who cannot or will not fit in. People say, I've always wanted to write full time, but I can't afford it. These people are enmeshed in the cancerous discipline of security. And in the worship of security, <coughs> we fling our lives beneath the wheels of routine, and before we know it, our lives are gone. The years thunder by, the dreams of youth grow dim, where they lie caked in dust on the shelves of patience. Before we know it, the tomb is sealed. Wherein, then, lies the answer? In choice. So which shall it be? Bankruptcy of purse or bankruptcy of life. And what he's really saying is, if you can afford to be a full-time writer, don't even bother. Because you, you won't be hungry enough. Right? So if you make this choice, um, it's going to be really hard. But I think you know that. Right? So I'm not going to encourage it any, anywhere beyond that. I hope to make one point today in the course of 30, 45 minutes. Um, it's it's hard to make a lot of points. So I'm really going to try and make one point and fill in some details around it. And that point is, um, has to do with the nature of challenge. And if you consider the spatial and temporal aspects of life, then I think that you can understand the nature of challenge in a way that helps you confront your greatest obstacles. And the reason is that you've confronted a lot of obstacles in your life already. And you can draw on those experiences to get you past the next ones. And so this is kind of the physicist, a physicist view of um, the hero's journey, this top right diagram. So um, how many of you have heard of, of Red Joseph Campbell? How many of you think he's full of shit? <laughs> OK. Um, I don't think he's full of shit, and I'll tell you why. I think that he actually was really on to something fundamental about the interface between the mind and reality, between people and different people, and between the five senses and interacting uh, in the physical world. That he really was close to understanding basically how we work and how, how we approach challenge. And he laid out a, a, a set of steps, which I reinterpreted um, for myself. And I wrote this book. And this book is, is um, these notes, as I said. This book is dedicated to you and me. And I really mean that sincerely. It's, um, I wrote it for me. <laughs> because I wanted to figure some stuff out. And in the course of it, I did figure some stuff out. And I figured, you know, I'd make a few dollars. <laughs> but it really is. So let's just go around this circle. Where the star is, is should you make this decision to actually jump out off of this cliff? And when you start, the first thing you're going to need are mentors and colleagues. Okay, you start to kind of ooze into a new situation. You write some things. Um, maybe you go and take some classes. 
Uh, you go to a workshop, you go to some literary events, you kind of walk in to this other world, and that's walking on the moon. Now, it's a different world, and this is more than a metaphor. As a writer, making this choice, even, even if, you, if you, know, you have two lives, they really are different worlds. The world of the writer is the world of, of your day job, if you will. Now, as you go deeper into this world, and you start submitting things, whether you submit a manuscript, whether you start writing articles for magazines, whether you send in um, short stories, you're going to begin wrestling with ogres. And what I mean by that, these are the gatekeepers. These are the people whose job it is to prevent bad things from entering their world. And that by the gatekeeper, of course, it's the poor person at, at um, Ziziva, for example. Ziziva is a literary magazine that's uh, headquartered a few blocks down the hill. And um, so it's the, in that example, the um, unpaid interns who look at, the, um, who look at the, the slush pile of things coming in are the gatekeepers. And their job is to try to keep the, you know, to separate the wheat from the chaff, if you want to be. So you have to find, you have them first. And they're going to try and keep you out of this world. And in that process of pushing up against that um, rock, pushing the rock up a hill in the Sisyphus analogy, um, you are paying your dues. And it's an initiation process. And initiation, however much it sucks, is important because you actually do learn things that will help you when you get in, get farther into the world. But when you get into the world, you will, um, you, it's frequent as we start to be become comfortable in a new world to see it on the inside. How many of you have ever worked in a restaurant? Okay, that restaurant, the kitchen looks somewhat different from, you know, back there where the dumpster is, looking in that door, from looking in the door in front, doesn't it? And I think everything, every endeavor has that aspect to it. And I call that hanging with Groucho, right? Because Groucho Marx sent a, a note to, um, what else, it was some elitist club in New York City saying, I want you to withdraw my membership because I would never want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> so it's, it's that kind of thing, right? It's like, oh man, I'm, I'm a writer, this amazing thing. And it's like, oh God, <laughs> you were a bunch of loser writers. <laughs> so there's that aspect to it, and that's important too, because without that, you can't really relax and be comfortable. You'll always be in awe, and you can't function in a world where when you're in awe of the citizens. And once you start being in that world, you change it. Whether you're the mail clerk at, um, say, if, if we're talking about some other example, a, a mail clerk at, at um, I don't know, at some big company or at a, a law firm, right? Some mail clerk is going, going to law school at night and working in the mail, the mail room. You start at the bottom. You work your way through. And, but in the process of that, you do change the world. You will have an effect. And um, at some point, as you, as you leave your, foot, your footprints around, you will um, have a breakthrough. This is the, the thing that, for most of us as writers, is really hard to imagine, that if you keep pushing, there will be a breakthrough. Now, maybe the length of time it takes to push is 100 years, and you'll be dead before the breakthrough comes. But I guarantee that if you push long enough and hard enough, there will be one. You just might not live long enough to get to it. All right, and I'll, I'll finish on that note, too. And then there comes a point where you have to make a, a fundamental decision about selling out or buying in. And this is a, a good example of this is the music industry, right? The producers say, if you do this to your song, it will become a hit. Well, no, I'm not going to, you can't mess with my, my music integrity. And, and sometimes what the producer says is wrong. And sometimes what they say is right, OK? Aerosmith, the producers were right. Aerosmith changed their style so that they could get a, a record deal, and it worked for them. Nirvana wouldn't change anything, and so they ended up going with with tiny independent um, label at first. And because they didn't change anything, they changed the music industry. I don't know any of you are. I don't know. Of course, we all know. Did you have a question? No, I'm serious. No, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so one time anyway, all right, I don't have time for this, but I won't use it. So my daughter was a huge Nirvana fan um, after, well after he died, 
and she wanted to go in 2000, she wanted, she was in eighth grade, and she wanted to go um, to Seattle for her um, this, on vacation. So I said, sure. So we have to, we go to this bridge in Aberdeen, Washington. And <coughs> this is the bridge where Kurt Cobain ran away. When he ran away from home, he would go and sleep under this bridge, and he wrote a lot of their songs there. So we go to this, and it's just like, there's just a street. It's not like a nice bridge or anything over a really kind of gross creek, rivery thing. And we go down there, and it's like church to this kid. He's sitting there, just like making me be quiet for four hours. <laughs> so I can say with um, absolute confidence that there is a bridge in Aberdeen, Washington, and on that bridge, there's a lot of graffiti in the phrase, Fuck you appears 28 times. <laughs> I have a lot of those stats written down. Anyway, the point being that you, have, you will make a decision about whether you work within or change that world. All right? And so for us right now in this state of publishing, the issue is, you know, are you going to go the um, legacy route with the agent to the publisher and pound your head up against that, are you just gonna go for it and, and watch the publishers tumble around you, maybe, right? So that, there's that kind of decision, a fork in the road that you will encounter. And um, like Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> so I, wanted, I wanted to give you um, one example of, of this, and I wanna get the phrase right. And it is this. So in, um, at the turn of the last century, there was this guy, Sean Fanning, right? The Napster guy. And so Sean Fanning really disrupted the music industry by creating Napster. Napster was, this, was the first file sharing. And so everybody could get music for free. And he, so he made the decision to um, break what, what was there, to go against the status quo. And... and um, the response from the entrenched interests were really, I love this quote. So Richard Parsons, who was Time Warner AOL's, AOL's CEO, said that what Napster had done, what Sean Fanning had done, it's an assault on everything that constitutes cultural expression of our society. And the corporations won't be the only ones hurt. Artists will have no incentive to create. Worst case scenario, the country will end up in a sort of cultural dark age. <laughs> so the point to you though, at this point, at this stage <coughs> of, of um, envisioning how your career will go after the breakthrough and while you're deciding uh, whether you push that rock up the hill in the time-honored fashion or whether you blaze your own trail, is that if you decide to blaze your own trail, the entrenched interests will fight you. Okay, They're going to fight you if you go the up the well-trod path too, but there they're just gonna do it with, with snobbery. If you blaze your own trail, they're gonna do it with venom, okay? So then the next step is delivering the goods. And so in the analogy, or in the case of a writer, um, if we break this down to this being your first successful book, say the first one that really makes a name for you, is that you have to take that back. You know, it's all one thing to have a great book as a writer, among writers and publishers, and in this world, but it means nothing until you take it back to that other world, the world that you came from, the world where the rest of the people live, and if they don't like it, it doesn't matter whether anyone else likes it. And there's a weird thing that happens, um, and I, I suspect that if you look back on your own accomplishments, other times you face challenge, that you will, you will, you will realize that there are times where you, you have this like this is incredible. I've got I've got these these tablets that I'm taking down the hill and, and nobody appreciates them because they don't know about this world, right? You have a, another dimension to your existence that the other people don't know. And and for example, here here's a better example. So you get your your <laughs> you get your um your short story in Ziziva, right? And you and what do you get? Wow! And you tell people like. You tell your mom or something, right? I like, got your kid, whatever. And it's like, oh yeah, what did they pay you? Ten free copies. <laughs> it's like, oh. And it's like, Ziziva, what is that? <laughs> oh, it's this, it's this literary review. And you realize, okay, I, I got this story in this this great literary review that no one's ever heard of, and no one reads except in this world. Um, woo. 
right? But it is. So this is the hard thing, you know. It's it's um, you know, sometimes you'll get this like you go on vacation. Like Hawaii is like that. You go to Hawaii and the vibe is so different. And and within an hour of being in Hawaii, usually it's like everything changes. Time slows down. And you know, an hour ago you were standing at the rental car line being pissed off because <coughs> this asshole from the East Coast is being annoying. But then you know you're standing in line at at some food store and you're getting yourself a mango. And it's really cool. <laughs> and it's like, no, go ahead of me. Really, I, I just have a mango. <laughs> so then you get on the plane. You get here, you know, in this cafe mode. You get on the plane and you come home. And then you're like in the the baggage handling. You still got that going. And people are elbowing you. It's like, what the hell's wrong with these people? <laughs> it's that sort of return to earth. The the delivering of the goods. And then you're in there, and you're as part of a new establishment. And this is, in fact, paradise. All right, Paradise is a funny thing. And um, I think, and here's a, a little quote. This is, I think it's original, but who knows? There's nothing original. But I, I find that paradise is much easier to find than it is to <coughs> recognize. And um, there's a lot of cases in our lives we can look at that and see that there were some really awesome periods of our life that maybe we didn't appreciate as much as we might want to if we had it all to do over. I think parenthood is a really good example of that. I mean, those little horrible cretins are driving you crazy and then they're gone. And it's like, oh man, damn. What do I do now? What do I do now? Well, I'll go and visit them. Those are really fun. Right, exactly. The point being that it, somewhere along the line, um, and probably for you now, you might even be at this other step, the previous step before making the decision as what's next. You know, I've done this, I've done it. What's next? And then you go back in and you make a decision um, and you jump off and you do something else. And you go through this over and over again. Now, the piece of this that, that um, may or may not be unique, but I want to point out is that I think that this structure of challenge is a fractal structure. Okay, now what a fractal is, a fractal is something that's self-similar. So I want you to picture um, a piece of parsley, right? If you have a big bunch of parsley and you tear off some, it looks just like the bigger piece, the sprig, right? You can keep tearing it and it keeps looking the same. That's self-similar behavior. And so as a writer, if we look at the outer circle of this, that outer circle is your writing career. Within that, that inside circle, that's writing and getting published your first book. Within that circle is maybe it's um, getting an agent, right? That's a whole nother challenge that's within these. But every one of them has, tends to have at least, you know, globally, not necessarily specifically, but a lot of common elements. And every challenge you've ever faced in your life also has those elements. So you've already done this, and you know how you do them, okay? This is a, an important thing to realize as you go through that you, you face challenge. This is not new, right? You've been scared by challenges before. It's not new. It's just different. And within that, you know, then there's writing the book, and within that, there's that annoying metaphor you never got right on page 23. And within that, there's that errant, errant apostrophe that somebody pointed out and want to kill him. <laughs> So um, that is the, the, the nature of challenge. It's hard to become a writer. You know, it's hard to become anything. These, it's, it's hard. And uh, I explain this to, uh, you know, go through this, and, and sometimes people say, yeah, but this is really hard. And it's like, yeah, it's harder now because of seven billion people. And the competition gets thicker and thicker. It's really hard. And then I think, yeah, man, those cavemen. It's so easy. <laughs> so challenge is challenge. It's just hard. But there are differences about becoming a writer with other challenges. And the main one is that there is no truly well-defined path. That if you go along this path and you're good at each step, that you will actually accomplish um, well, my goal, of course, is to be left alone in a dark corner with a couple of dogs and a laptop and write stuff and then have it go off into the ether and have money appear on the porch, right? Without anybody knocking on the door and anything, I don't want to deal with it. But you're almost there, caveman. 
um, I think that's a really good point because a lot of writers have the personality that they really don't want to deal with a lot of people. And it's that in the old days, we didn't have to worry about being visible and being online and blogging and having platforms. You know? That's right. You just wrote your book and sent it out and hope for the best. It's Can you very, talk about that trend? Yeah, well, I'm going right there. Okay. I'm going right there. Thank you. Um, so part of this is, is this new world thing, right, which I call walking on the moon. And um, I want to give you a, a quick little example of how this really is a new world. Um, there's this don't quit your day job, right? People will say, oh, great, yeah, don't quit your day job. And the reason they say that is because, because you are a freak. <laughs> you are an alien. And people won't understand it. What you're doing, if you make this decision, it's like, what are you, nuts? Well, yeah. But the, the distinction between normal and different is very weird in human cultures. In San Francisco, there is a, it's a pretty broad band, right? You gotta be pretty weird to be far off as weird. Uh, but I, I lived in Dallas for a while. You don't have to be that weird to be considered weird in Dallas. But let me give you an example. Um, say somebody came from, from some other planet, but looks human, goes to a diner, and goes in for breakfast. And they go in, you know, they don't want to draw any attention to themselves, so they go in, they see people are, are in chairs around tables. Okay, so I'm going to get, and they get in the chair, except that they stand on the chair instead of sitting. And it's, in their mind, it's like, I'm using the chair, I'm in front of the table, why are they all looking at me? It's a, actually a very small distinction um, in action. You're using the chair, but man, you're a freak, okay? <laughs> so if you make the decision to leave a well-paying job to uh, become a writer, and you know that you have no guarantees, you're a freak. And so you have to expect to be treated like that. And in the course of being treated like that, you're going to deal with people who are going to annoy you. And don't blame them, blame yourself. You're the freak, not them. Okay, and power to you, right? Um, and the, a side of that is something that, that um, I, I hope you realized before you came, but the next time you come to one of these things, this is a very important lesson that I don't think I have quite learned yet, and I certainly didn't have this lesson in mind when I entered this, this world and made this decision myself, and that is, it's very important that you leave your ego at the door. Whoever you are in that other world is irrelevant here, okay? We're writers. I'm a physicist. Surely you're impressed, but no, you're not. Or maybe you are, but not for the reasons I want you to be, right? I want you to think, oh, he's a physicist. He must write really well. Why would you think that? It's, in fact, the opposite is what I experienced is, you know, I've got some credibility as a physicist. I have none as a writer, so I'll write this thing in. It doesn't work that way. And there's a couple of problems with it. The biggest problem is that if you have this ego, people are going to think that you don't need help. Whereas if you don't have an ego, people will help you because you need help. So it's not about belittling yourself. It's about entering a new world and initial, getting the initialization there. Now, don't forget who you were, all right? Because that ego, you're going to need it later, right? Because that's when you return with your book, that's some credibility you're going to need. But in this world, it's nothing. It's nothing. And all it's going to do is confuse people. So... Now to your, your question, and this is the question essentially of safety nets, all right? And safety nets, I want you to think about safety nets in two different ways. One is part of your platform, and we'll come to that in a minute. But first, if you make this choice, you need to understand within your own head and within your family of what safety nets you need to survive, okay? Now some people can just jump off the cliff. I don't need a safety net, you know. I'm gonna spend every cent I have, and if if I end up homeless, I'm just gonna keep pushing, gonna keep writing, and that some people can do that. I can't do that. Golly, no, I don't even like the Holiday Inn, man. I'm just living in Petaluma. I don't want to give that up. So what safety nets do you need? How much money do you need? How can you get it? So. Um, 
Let's see, there's, I want to get this right. There's a, there's an exercise in here. This book's got a bunch of exercises because, oh, I just remembered. My daughter points out, when I told her I wrote this book, she, um, The Family Guy, are you familiar with this animated show, The Family Guy? Well, in The Family Guy, there's this dog, Brian, who's the intellectual on the show. And uh, Brian, Brian writes a self-help book because he claims any idiot, any idiot can write a self-help book and it always becomes a bestseller. So what safety nets do you need to make your goals seem possible? All right, and then are they primarily financial? Are they educational? Are they emotional? Or something I haven't thought of, right? There's different types of safety nets. And do you need permission to break the rules you've always lived by? That's a different kind, that's more of an emotional safety net. All right, now um, I like to think, and I suspect for the vast majority of you, that um, your family will support you when you come out and say, I've always wanted to do this, and I'm going for it. People will usually surprise you. There will be a short period where they're kind of freaked out. Oh, wow, what the hell is this idiot doing? But, but then, you know, they love you, right? And so they will come around as well as they can. It's very difficult for parents to come around because parents are motivated by worry, right? I think that you can predict every action a parent will make on the assumption that they don't want to worry about their kid. I want my kid to have a secure, boring job with really good health insurance, and that's it. That's what I want. I don't want her taking crazy risks. Well, actually, I do, but that's because I'm a nut job. <laughs> and she is too. But anyway, yeah, my kid's got a one-way ticket to Amsterdam. She wants to be a Dutch citizen, and she's going to be an illegal immigrant. Good luck. <laughs> Go, baby. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there's emotional safety nets. There's financial safety nets. Write down every one that you think you need. And then, equally important to that, look at each one and estimate the probability that should you need it, you would actually use it, and the probability that you'd actually need it. All right, what I mean by this is that there are worst case scenarios and there are high probability worst case scenarios. The very worst case scenario is very unlikely to happen, right? If you choose to become a full-time writer, the chances that you are going to go down a spiral and become homeless and destitute that's not your most likely worst case scenario. A more, a more likely worst case scenario is that you struggle and you have to keep, you know, go back and do some work. Maybe go back to your old life periodically. Maybe you decide that this is no good. But those are safety nets. The other one, of course, is, is familial support. And if um, you're married and your spouse doesn't support you and this is important enough to you, you have to get a divorce. Because you can't do this. You can't do this without, without the support of your spouse. I've, I've known people who've tried to do that and it just, it destroys their marriage anyway. It's, this is, I mean, we're not kidding around. This is really a stupid decision. <laughs> I made it, right? In, in, August, in August, actually, it was July of 2005. Um, on one day, I was um, I was a uh, um, I was uh, working as a research well actually kind of a marketing research scientist at Agilent Technologies, Agilent Technologies, which used to be part of Hewlett Packard, really really high tech stuff. And they came and said, um, we want to we want two people, we want two volunteers who will take a package to leave the company because we we want to cut of the workforce by two people. And um, and I was thinking, and I go home. And on the phone is that a little East Bay magazine had accepted a, an article that I'd sent in like a year before and totally forgotten. And they were paying me, you know, $278 for this. And I got that. And it was a sign. The gods had spoken. The yellow brick road was before me. So I was like, wow, I got to do it. I got to do it. And it was a nice little package. And I figured, what, it's going to take six, seven months. I should be making a living as a writer within that. You know, it'd be no problem. You know, I, these writers, I can, I'm a physicist, I can outwrite them. You know, they don't work hard. Um, and there's actually a couple of lessons that I would point out from my experience with that, is that confidence born of ignorance is actually a very powerful thing. <laughs> it really is. And if you don't have 
some stupid confidence in you, I, I really think it's a bad idea to do this. If you're too realistic, it's going to be really harder. Much better to have, um, to have the realism hit you in the head a few times before you accept it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say, it seems like the missing link between that two is going, sort of going over a list of your motivation and your, ded your absolute dedication to it. And is, do you find like there's a way to test that of like how much you are absolutely dedicated to this craft and writing where you're willing to jump off because you know it's something you, you have to do it, not, not just you want to, but you absolutely have to. And that's a really personal thing. And that's not something I would ever I would ever impose on somebody. That's just too personal. We're all different. I kind of I would use an analogy, you know, when um, when someone's spouse dies, for example, the way people grieve is really unique to each person, and I'm just not going to question it. So, um, so that kind of goes into don't quit your day job. I'm never going to tell you not to quit your day job. If you want to do this, I'm going to just say it's going to be really hard. Work your ass off, man, and I'll see you on the other side, right? We'll get there one way or another. I actually believe that um, uh, time scale, there's actually a chapter in here on time scale. People, people have, actually every physical system has time scales associated with it. A human time scale is the, about a second, the time between pulses. That's the present. We also are tuned to time scales of, of course, a day and a month, a moon, a season, a year, a decade, and a lifetime. There's different, there's different time scales, and each time scale has some different properties. You can only actually act right now, and, and now, and now, okay, in the present. You can't do anything in the future, and you can't do anything in the past. But those nows added up over the course of a day, well, you hope to knock off a few things on your to-do list, getting you made a few steps farther along your path. Um, a month, I think a month is actually a very amuse, interesting and somewhat amusing time scale. I call it the mundane time scale because it's the billing period. A month is an annoying time period. It's where problems that are actually trivial seem big. Whether or not you pay your visa bill doesn't add up to shit when you're dead, right? <laughs> but in the course of, of Four weeks, it's kind of a big deal, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a trivial annoyance. It's a mundane problem. It's very real, but it's kind of funny, a month. But on the course of a season, people are, are, have evolved to expect results on the course of three months, right? That's, that's you're planting the fields, you're growing them, you're harvesting. You expect tangible results. A year is a period of reflection. I propose that a decade is the time scale, not exactly, maybe it's five years, maybe it's four, maybe it's 12, but a decade is the time scale of accomplishment. That if you go in and you develop a career, then it's on the scale of a decade that you will conquer that world and then maybe decide to do something else. Right? I'm in that job because I was a particle physicist for 15 years, I worked in high tech, for um, 10, I kind of still do, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and now I'm doing this, right? So I've, I've really wanted to do very different things um, at different points in my life. And it's just because I like diversity of experience, and um, I'm gonna be dead in you know, probably 50 years or something, so who cares? So, this brings us to, got the safety nets, and that is building a platform that can hold you up. So the trick is, if you can build your platform in such a way that it pays you, then what we're really trying to do is take how you make a living now and get to how you want to make a living as a writer and bridge that, okay? Now, some people have jobs that are really amenable to this and don't know it. Some people have those jobs and do know it, right? Professor Andy over here, he's kind of got a, the natural platform, right? He's an English professor at the University of California at Davis. People might expect him to be a writer. He already is. They kind of pay him to read and write and stuff, okay? That's, that's a natural platform. But if you look, at how many of you are familiar with Publishers Marketplace? Right, if you're not, you gotta write this down. Publishersmarketplace.com. 
they it's a um, it's kind of an online trade magazine and they will give you for free um, a lot of information and if you pay twenty dollars a month then you'll get a ton of information but among that information are deals every day they report the publishing deals that have been made and if you look at those you will see how agents and publishers spin the platform of their writers and a couple of weeks ago one came I saw and it was and it was it had an author pitched as um, a Microsoft Microsoft programming ace debut novel dot 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 that was you know about some programming thing or some you know, some bad software or viruses or what have you but the point was ace Microsoft ace programming well first of all Microsoft doesn't have any ace programmers they all live in Silicon Valley okay so it's crappy programming jock writes a book but that's a platform he probably didn't ever thought of that as a platform what I write code <laughs> but that's a platform okay so it really is taking what you do to make a living and figuring out how to bridge that whether you can get paid to write about what you do in maybe trade magazines I do a lot of that um, and then step that into more mainstream magazines or and then move that to a platform where you have an audience built okay this is really the trick is figuring out how to get there and and have that fulfill your safety net so you sort of get a magic bullet in the absence of that um, there's always consulting which is a good way to starve to death especially <laughs> if you really would much rather be writing fiction and so you turn down gigs <laughs> oh. so um, we're almost out of time so I just wanted to say a couple of things real quick networking I just want to mention networking uh, networking at your pay scale is very very important you know, we're, we feel compelled to network above us, to network with agents and people we consider important, but it's actually at least as important to network at your own pay scale because some of you will go up the, up the ladder faster than others, and it's really easy to ask a, to ask a colleague a favor who, you know, you sat in this room <coughs> than it is to ask somebody who's already up the food chain for a favor. So, so finally, I want to end with this. Um, have any of you been told that get, making a living as a writer is sort of like winning the lottery? Yeah, yeah that's bullshit, okay? <laughs> I know a lot about probability and statistics. Let me explain why that's just total crap. Every time you buy a lottery ticket, the odds are ridiculously low that you'll, that you'll win. In fact, I can say that none of you will win the lottery. Okay? No matter how many tickets you buy, I'm absolutely confident that you won't win the lottery. And the reason is, every time you buy it, the odds suck. As you are a writer, and you go through, and you struggle, your odds get better all the time. It's nothing like a lottery. Your odds continue to improve. And I think, I really do believe, that if you push really hard with some dedication over on the time scale of a decade, that you will succeed. It's just a long time, and it's hard. And the thing that makes it hard, really hard for writers is that... Um, you're going to get 99 rejections for every go-ahead. For every opportunity that you squeeze out of this industry, you're going to have your head slapped 99 times, and that's hard. It's not like other jobs where you go into a meeting and you present you know, this thing you did last week, and everybody says, oh, that's really cool. You got that done. Great. We'll take that off. Good for you. doesn't happen. What happens here is you kill yourself over a manuscript, and you send it out, and all you get are ding, 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 ding. And then you get a little nibble, and then you get a ding. <laughs> right? It's really something. I actually um, don't recommend this, but I have, a, I have a whiteboard in my office. I do recommend that. But I keep score. I have um, tick marks for every ding I get and every opportunity that comes in. And the thing about opportunities is that they narrow. So there's going to be fewer of them. But it's, it's just going to be tough. So we have like seconds for any any more comments or questions, Kristen. Who are some of your mentors in this process? My mentors are um, Tamim Ansari, who runs the San Francisco Writers Workshop, um, Jack Bulware, and Jane Ginal, who who um, invented Litquake, um, and a whole bunch of writers that I've met by by drinking in bars <laughs> with um, literary events. 
you have to figure out your way how you network, all right? And everybody networks differently, I think. And if you're an introvert, networking is difficult. When I'm in a room with people I don't know, I want to get the hell out of them, all right? Um, I networked pretty well these last three days. This is my eighth year at this conference, though. I'm comfortable here. The first year I came, it was killing myself. You know, I had to put a crowbar to the back <coughs> of my neck just to get to say something to someone, and I was so ugh. So for me, if I can manage to stay in one place long enough, I will eventually talk to somebody, and that's networking. And usually the way it happens is that somebody will say something brilliant or stupid, and I have to make a crack. <laughs> <laughs> um, you made a comment before about publishing those books, and you said that was the last time you would do it. Self-publishing is um, for the detail-oriented, and only the detail-oriented is my experience. What I mean, if it costs $25 to print a book, you have to sell it for a lot more. Right. Well, it's, when you give a, a speech, and if I have if I have somebody who contracts me to give that speech, then um, I can you know that's really what what how I wrote this book was that I could sell those as handouts to every person that a company would have go to my seminar or something like that. It just turned out to be cheaper and not potentially easier, but cheaper to have to do this through Create Space, and it looks better. But God, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Very detailed stuff. All right, we have to stop.